All right, my apologies. I'm going to read Jeff's introduction off my phone because my computer has decided to freak out today. Um, but thanks, everyone, for coming. And thanks for Jeff for uh, agreeing to do this on semi-short notice. Uh, he was coming in town for an academic workshop we're doing later this afternoon, so we thought it'd be great to have him talk about some of his other work as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jeff Sebo is the clinical assistant, a clinical assistant professor of environmental studies, an affiliated professor, professor of bioethics, medical ethics, and philosophy, and the director of the Animal Studies Master's Program at in, NYU. Um, Jeff uh, works primarily in moral, social, and political philosophy, with an emphasis on bioethics, animal ethics, and environmental ethics. Uh, his current work focuses on agency, sentience, and moral slash political standing, the ethics of food, animals, and the environment, and the ethics of ad activism, advocacy, and philanthropy. His book, Food, Animals, and the Environment, An Ethical Approach, co-authored with Christopher Sherman, is forthcoming from Rutledge, and his book, Why Animals Matter for Climate Change, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Um, in addition to his academic work, Jeff sits on the board of the board of directors for uh, Animal Charity Evaluators, um, and the board of Minding Animals International, uh, where I saw him speak a couple times last January. Uh, and he's on the executive committee of the Animals and Society Institute. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks so much. Testing, testing, okay, great. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, and to uh, the law school uh, animal law group here for inviting me to give this talk and hang out and get to know you. This is really exciting. This is a fantastic community and people here are working on really wonderful things. So this is a great opportunity for me to get to know people here and uh, talk about some of these, I think, pretty important issues. So what I want to talk about today is the moral and legal and political standing of non-human animals and especially the legal and political standing of non-human animals. And I want to present a case for animal personhood and animal rights, non-human personhood and non-human rights that philosophers and lawyers and primatologists and other people have been collaborating on for the past decade or so, but especially in, in recent years. So, so uh, to start with, I should acknowledge that the talk today will be based on collaborative work that I did with a team of philosophers and lawyers. Uh, this is based on an amicus brief that I co-authored with a group of uh, 16 other philosophers as part of a case that the Non-Human Rights Project was bringing in the New York Court of Appeals in spring of 2018. They were advocating for habeas corpus relief for two chimpanzees, Kiko and Tommy, to the New York Court of Appeals. And as part of that, they asked for amicus briefs from philosophers, lawyers, and uh, primatologists to support various aspects of their argument. And so this team of philosophers uh, wrote an extended argument for why all of the various reasons courts have rejected the idea of non-human personhood are uninformed or inconsistent or otherwise unreasonable and fail. So we, we made that argument, and uh, then we developed that argument into a book called Chimpanzee Rights, which came out in September. And so I want to acknowledge, first of all, the team of philosophers I worked with, and second of all, the Non-Human Rights Project, which uh, was, was the impetus for, for this project. OK, great. Uh, so most of what I say will be on behalf of the team, but I will sometimes express my own view about things, as well as you can imagine, philosophers might not agree about all that much. So the fact. <laughs> The fact that 17 of us were able to agree on, on the core points in this talk is kind of remarkable, and uh, I think a testament to how seriously we all take these issues. So, as we all know, probably as everybody in this room knows, animals, many animals at least, are sentient beings. They are conscious, they are emotional, they have some kind of sense of self, they have bonds of care and interdependence, they have lots of intelligence of various kinds, uh, and they matter, they matter. Morally, they matter and we care about them, and we treat them terribly <laughs> in many respects, especially under the law. We treat them like objects, property, commodities under the law, and that facilitates a lot of terrible forms of treatment in food, in research, in entertainment, in homes, in the wild. We can use animals for our own purposes in ways that are deeply harmful, deeply invasive. We can treat them in ways we would never, at least in our better moments, treat other human beings. And that is, of course, bad for non-human health and well-being, and is also, of course, bad for human health and well-being, because the way we treat non-human animals affects humans as well. For example, animal agriculture not only harms and kills an estimated 100 plus billion non-human animals a year domesticated and one to three trillion per year wild, but also is a leading cause of land and water consumption. 
uh, antimicrobial use, which can lead to the development of ant antimicrobial resistant pathogens, and global anthropogenic climate change, an estimated 9% of carbon emissions, 37% of methane emissions, and 65% of nitrous oxide emissions are all attributable to animal agriculture. So how we treat animals, of course, matters for animals in staggering numbers to staggering degrees, and it affects us, too, in ways that could be catastrophic unless we get our act together and we do that soon. So this talk is about one of the legal obstacles in the way of getting our act together, which is the current legal standing of non-human animals. As I said, they are sentient beings, they are subjects, but we treat them as objects under the law. So why is it that we treat them as objects under the law? I think there are various reasons. One of them is, of course, obvious. This is uh, an, an act of self-interest. This is yet another case of a dominant group taking uh, advantage of that position of dominance by, uh, in various ways, oppressing a vulnerable group. But I think there is more to it as well, uh, some of which is pretty legally and morally sophisticated and reveals mistakes in reasoning that we are making that is uh, benefiting us and, and harming non-human animals. So why is it that we think that non-human animals are objects under the law? One reason is that in most legal jurisdictions, there are only two legal categories an entity can occupy. You can either be a person or a thing under the law. Those are the only two categories that exist. And if you are a person, then you have the capacity for rights. And if you are a thing, then you do not have the capacity for rights. This is literally the definition of the person-thing binary. A person is, under the law, by definition, an entity with the capacity for some rights. And a thing is, by definition, under the law, an entity without the capacity for any rights. And then when it comes to what rights a person has, that depends on the person and who they are and their capacities and their vulnerabilities and their relationships. And different persons have different rights. Children have different rights from adults. And, and uh, fellow community members might have different rights than people in other communities. But to be a person is simply to be an entity with the capacity for any rights at all. So we think like this. We think, well, you need to be a person to have rights. And you need to be a human to be a person. So you need to be a human to have rights. And, and since non-humans are not humans, they cannot be persons, and therefore they cannot have rights. I think this is at least roughly implicitly the type of reasoning that we engage in. This reasoning, of course, I will argue, is wrong. Uh, it is not the case that only humans can be persons and only humans can have rights. And I think when we think about it uh, uh, explicitly, we can see pretty clearly why, why that would be true. So why would we think that only humans can be persons? Why would we think that only humans can be persons? There are various reasons. I will briefly discuss three and explain why I think these are not good enough reasons to say that only humans can be persons. First of all, I think some people think only humans can be persons because they literally think that the words human and person are synonymous, that they mean the same thing. These words are interchangeable. <clears throat> to be a person is to be a human, and to be a human is to be a person. They are analytically, definitionally equivalent. But this, under the law, is simply not true. It might be colloquially true, how we use the word in everyday conversation, which is part of what distorts things. But under the law, human is a biological concept that refers at present to a member of a particular species, homo sapiens, or homo sapiens sapiens. Whereas person is a moral and legal concept, a normative concept that refers to an individual who can hold moral and legal rights. So even if in everyday conversation we conflate these terms, under the law, they have very different meanings. One is descriptive and one is prescriptive. And so if we want to say that only humans can be persons in this sense, we need to have a substantive argument for that conclusion that stands up to scrutiny. So what kind of argument would that be then? What kind of argument could we offer that would vindicate the idea, the substantive normative thesis, that only humans can be persons with the capacity for rights? Well, here are two possibilities. Some people think that only humans can be persons because humanity is the basis of personhood, is the source of our rights. Our shared humanity is where our shared rights come from. But this is not 
acceptable. <laughs> this is not an acceptable conception of person. And all this does is yet again, as we often do, obviously there are differences across cases, yet again, as we often do, base membership in the moral community on membership in some social or biological group that I magically happen to be a member of. But of course, species are simply one taxonomic category among many that biologists and other scientists use in order to explain, predict, and control various empirical phenomena. There is simply nothing normatively special about this particular taxonomic category in and of itself that would make it the case that being a member of this group magically gives you rights, and if you are outside of the group, then you are deprived of rights no matter what you might be like and what your might, life might be like. And I think we can see this especially clearly when we think about the nature of species. Species are dynamic, abstract, taxonomic entities. They have a lot of variability within species. Members of the same species are quite different. A lot of similarity across species. Members of different species are quite similar. And a lot of change in species over time, uh, in, naturally, and then especially if we introduce the effects of technology on the development of species, we can see this especially clearly. This is simply not the type of entity that can support something as pivotal as whether you merit a right to freedom from suffering or a right to life or liberty or property or anything like that. And I think that we can see this again, especially, especially clearly if we reflect on the basis for our own rights. If you think about why is it that I merit moral respect and compassion and concern and consideration. Why is it that people have obligations to treat me with decency? I think you would probably not think that the answer is, well, I happen to be classified in this particular category in a biology textbook, or I bet if I got a DNA test, it would reveal that I happen to be a member of this particular taxonomic category, and then, whew, it turns out you, can, you have to treat me with respect instead of eating me. Uh, I think that would probably not be our answer. Our answer would be, well, I, I matter because I, I can feel pleasure and pain and I can feel emotions and, and I have these relationships of, of care and interdependence with other humans and other, other animals and those are the reasons why my life matters and why you have an obligation to treat me with respect and compassion. But once we recognize that basic fact, then we have to recognize that humanity cannot be in and of itself the basis of our personhood and our rights. <coughs> So other people then say, okay, fine, humanity is not in and of itself magically the reason we have personhood and rights, but humanity is why we have other morally relevant capacities like our abstract capacities for language and reason. Humans have this special ability to use language and reason in these abstract and sophisticated ways, and those abilities are what give us our moral and legal standing, our moral and legal personhood and rights, because our language and reason, of course, allow us to do all sorts of incredible and morally relevant things. For example, they allow us to enter into social contracts with each other. And these social contracts allow us to build political communities with each other and establish laws and rights and, and protections and responsibilities and then hold each other accountable to those ideals. Our language and reason is necessary for that. And that is necessary for this entire moral and political enterprise. So our humanity gives us language and reason, and our language and reason gives us social contracts and political communities. And that is why only humans can be persons, is, is the sort of more sophisticated version of this argument. But notice the conception of personhood and rights that this argument is advancing. In order to be a person with rights on this conception of personhood, you need this particularly sophisticated form of language and reason that frankly not all humans have, especially at all points in their lives. We are all, when we are born, not <laughs> particularly linguistic or rational. Many of us lose those capacities somewhere along the way. Many of us never develop them at all. But what is crucial and, and, and really important about modern conceptions of legal and political personhood and rights is that we recognize that even if we might lack a robust set of legal duties and responsibilities in those moments, even if we might not be fully legally responsible for our actions in those moments where we lack full use of language and reason, we are still persons with rights, rights that are appropriate to who we are in those moments and what our capacities and interests and vulnerabilities are in those moments. And this is why, and again, this is absolutely not to equate these categories with non-human animals. There are many relevant differences among them. But this is why human infants have rights. This is why humans with especially severe 
cognitive disabilities that might not make them able to enter into certain types of contracts and offer informed consent for certain types of actions, why they still have rights. They have rights because they have other features that matter, like consciousness and emotionality and relationships of care. Uh, and so whether or not they have responsibilities might depend on whether they in those moments have this sophisticated form of language and reasoning, but whether they have rights, whether they merit moral and legal concern for their own sake, should not depend on whether they meet that very high bar for language and reason. We all recognize this, for the most part, in the case of, of humans, as we should. But if we apply that consistently, then, we have to reject the language and reason conception of personhood in the case of non-human animals, too. It would, it would be speciesist. It would be inconsistent for us to set a much higher standard for personhood in the non-human case than in the human case. And so the choice that we face, which I think the, the solution is obvious, is that if we want to be both inclusive and consistent, then, then we really do have no choice but to accept that uh, a wider conception of personhood is appropriate in both the human and the non-human case. So if we take the standard that we find appropriate in the human case, uh, if, we, if we say that personhood depends on possession of one or more of the capacities that I mentioned earlier, consciousness, emotionality, a sense of self, bonds of care and interdependence. If we think that you're being a person, you're having some rights or at least the capacity for some rights, if you think that depends on possession of one or more of those capacities, that would be great because it would live up to modern conceptions of human rights and justice that include everyone independently of age, ability, so on and so forth. Uh, but it would also include many non-human animals too because many non-human animals also have some or more of uh, those features. Right? Uh, and I, I think that is clearly the way to resolve this conflict, is to expand our conception of personhood in a consistent way, in a way that would include uh, at least the possibility of non-humans being persons with rights as well. That would be much better than continuing to have a completely inconsistent conception of personhood rooted in our speciesism. And it would also be better than achieving consistency simply by having an unacceptably narrow and prejudicial conception of personhood in both the human and non-human case. So I think this is the right, uh, right response. And I think most people, when they think about the arguments, find it plausible that this is the right response. And at the same time, I think that many people nevertheless feel resistant to this idea that non-humans can be persons too and can have rights too. And thinking about why people might be resistant is interesting and important because, for example, this is what is causing judges in U.S. courts to make some pretty preposterous arguments uh, uh, in order to continue to exclude non-human animals from the legal community. Uh, so I think, I think part of what is going on here is that when people are confronted with these arguments, they see that the second you take these arguments seriously, it raises all of these further difficult questions and opens up the possibility that we might have a moral and legal responsibility to pretty fundamentally change many aspects of our society. So, for example, if you allow that it is even conceptually possible for non-humans to be persons, and that some non-humans, in fact, like chimpanzees or elephants or maybe even others, that they, in fact, might be persons, then you have to ask questions like this. Well, which non-human animals are going to be persons? Or which non-human entities are going to be persons? Where are we going to draw the line now if not at species membership? If chimpanzees are persons, are bonobos persons? Are cats and dogs persons? Are cows and chickens and pigs and fishes persons? All of the animals that we experiment on? What about ants? the estimated 10 quintillion insects in the world, are they going to be persons? What about sophisticated artificial intelligence programs of the kind that will be developed over the next couple of decades? Are they going to have to be persons? Right? Avatars in, in simulated uh, uh, software, are they going to be persons? Right? Those are weird and challenging questions. Uh, and you have to ask, what rights are these persons going to have? So fine, maybe they have the right to habeas corpus. Maybe they have the right to some basic form of life and liberty, are they also going to have some version of a right to freedom of association, freedom of expression? Are they going to have some kind of right to have their interests represented by the legislative process? Are they going to have some kind of right to political participation? 
those are also kind of weird and challenging questions. But again, when we think about it in the human case, we have a remarkable capacity for creativity uh, and thoughtfulness when it comes to achieving political inclusion for uh, humans who might not meet conventional standards for ability to uh, participate in the political process. So they're not straightforwardly absurd questions, but they are very difficult. Uh, and again, finally, you have to ask, are we going to have to change our practices in fundamental ways? If you allow for the possibility of non-human personhood, you have to think about the fact that our food system, our medical research system, uh, many aspects of our entertainment system are all rooted in a form of treatment of other sentient beings that would be straightforwardly unacceptable if we acknowledge that these individuals are persons with rights. Maybe some forms of animal use would still be fair game, depending on how we analyze the relevant issues. But a lot of what we currently do would not be. And I think we recognize that, too. So a judge is faced with these arguments. They have a habeas corpus petition. The Non-Human Rights Project is saying, these chimpanzees are being held in solitary confinement on a roadside cage, and we want them to have habeas relief so they can be represented in court and they can be brought to a sanctuary. And the judge sees the plausibility of all the arguments, but then they think, wait a second. If I say that they have the right to habeas corpus relief, that means they technically count as a person. That means non-humans can technically count as a person. And I, on a Tuesday, have opened the floodgates, and now our entire legal system is going to have to change. And I think judges somewhere feel a little freaked out by that. And so they reach for whatever argument they can find so that they can justify maintaining the status quo, kicking the can down the road a little bit longer. And so they reach for, ah, species membership is the basis for personhood, or language and reason and ability to enter into contracts as the basis of personhood, forgetting that, of course, we all reject these arguments in the human case, and forgetting that species membership is an arbitrary taxonomic category. Um, so the main thing that I would say right now is I think we can all agree that, A, these questions are hard. The answers to them are not obvious. Uh, B, it is OK to live in confusion and uncertainty for a little while. Um, but C, the fact that these questions are hard and a little bit scary and a little bit destabilizing is not a reason not to ask them. It is not a reason to ignore what appears to be a pretty clear injustice. Uh, nor is it a reason to answer them in the same ways that we always have. We know from history that sometimes we have to ask hard questions and sometimes we have to answer them in new ways in order to achieve the kind of just society that we have always been working toward. And I think this is another case of that. And so what I would say finally, and then I want to explore a couple of uh, sort of questions about moving forward and then we can have a discussion, is again, I think it can be okay to feel a little bit confused and uncertain about these issues and, and to not feel as though we have to have all these issues worked out in order to take the first step in this discussion. I think when things feel complicated in these ways, it can help to start by stating a kind of simple basic truth and then going from there and seeing where that takes you. And in this case, I think that the simple basic truth is that non-human animals, especially non-human animals like chimpanzees, are not merely things. They are not merely objects and should not be treated merely as things or merely as objects under the law. We can start there and then figure out how to develop that view, what kind of legal status they should have that would be appropriate to the types of individuals they are and the types of relationships they have, and then what that implies for other non-humans and what that implies for other rights. We can take that step by step, but I think it starts, it, 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 it helps to start with that, with that basic idea. Okay, so, so a, a, a couple of thoughts about moving forward then, and then I, I wanna hear what, what questions or comments or objections people have. Uh, is there are different ways forward that people are exploring right now. So I'll mention two and, and say a couple of words about their relative strengths and limitations. So one way forward is the way that I've been discussing in this talk, which is the, the strategy that the Non-Human Rights Project is taking in the US, which is a strategy of preserving the binary distinction between persons and things, where persons have the capacity for rights and things lack the capacity for rights. But drawing the line in a different place, expanding the scope of personhood so that, yes, there are still only two categories, but many more individuals count as persons with the capacity for rights than we previously thought. That would be one strategy. The benefit of the strategy is that when you define personhood and thinghood in that way, a person has the capacity for rights and a thing lacks it, it is a kind of simple, clean distinction 
where you can draw a line and say, this is our political community. These are the individuals with rights. Yes, their rights are going to vary based on who they are as individuals and what their capacities and, and vulnerabilities are. Not everyone will have the same rights. But these are the individuals with rights, and, and then we can add nuance from there. Um, but the cost of this approach is that, as we've seen with many judges in the US and, and many people in general, um, it requires you to accept this seemingly radical idea that non-humans can be persons. And I think that is a very difficult idea, for example, to get added into constitutional language or like legislative language. It, it, it would be a much longer road to get that type of language incorporated into the law. Right? So another strategy that people have been exploring in all sorts of contexts is uh, disrupting this binary distinction between humans and things by creating essentially a third middle ground category, which for the most part people have been calling the category of sentient beings. So on this idea, we would now have three categories. You would have persons, you would have things, persons with rights, things without rights, and then sentient beings who occupy some kind of liminal space between those categories. So for example, uh, Quebec, uh, uh, the French Parliament, Colombia, most recently Mexico City, have all added language to various uh, laws saying that non-human animals are sentient beings and for that reason we have certain types of moral and legal obligations to them. Mexico City did a remarkable version of this. They enacted a new constitution in September of this year and it has what I think might be the most animal friendly language in any constitutional text in the Americas, if not in the world, it says animals are sentient beings. We have individual and collective moral and legal responsibilities to treat them accordingly. Uh, and then they, they just started this new animal protection agency with 15 employees who are going to be <laughs> representing the interests of animals within the government. So people are doing really interesting things. And so the benefit of this approach is that there is room, I think, right now to uh, get people to acknowledge that animals are different from mere objects enough so that we can enter some form of legal standing for them in legal texts. Uh, creating this third category is enough so that people feel comfortable right now putting it in constitutions and putting it in laws and creating animal protection language. But the cost, I think, the, the limitation of this approach is that it can be difficult to figure out what this third category means and what sorts of protections it involves. Right? So, so if I am a sentient being instead of a person, does that mean that I can't have rights? Does it mean that you can still uh, you know, breed and raise and kill me for food or for research or for entertainment? Um, so there, there's a little bit of a risk that it creates a legal basis for a category of sort of second class citizens that can be vulnerable to all sorts of harms. And then, of course, there could be a further risk that once this category exists, maybe it makes sense to put some humans in it, which would, of course, be a huge step backwards. Uh, and, and so that would be a sort of philosophical or ideological reason to be a little bit concerned about this, what you might see as a middle ground compromise strategy. Um, so so I'd, I'd be interested to hear what people think about this. My own view at the moment, which is highly uncertain, is that it is not at all clear which of these two strategies is the best one, especially for a particular uh, political community at a particular point in time. I think we need to see different people trying different things out and to see what happens. And so I'm happy that the Non-Human Rights Project is taking one approach in the United States, that other people are taking other approaches in other jurisdictions. Uh, I, I, I'm excited to see what happens. Um, but, I, but I do worry a little bit that the personhood approach um, might take a while to, to get started, and I worry a little bit that the sentient being approach might not uh, uh, be strong enough to really change practices in the relevant community. But either way, honestly, and this will be the last thing I say and then, and then we can have a discussion, either way, even if you magically did get personhood language into a legal text, um, in both cases, that would not by itself change any of our forms of treatment of animals. Changing the law is a really important lever in order to treat animals better, but it is only a first step or one among many steps. And even if you do get animal protection language into a constitution or you get recognition of animals as persons by a judge somewhere, uh, that would still have to come along with a lot of activism and advocacy and other uh, grassroots political work in order to change 
uh, social views about animals so that there would be enough popular support to actually put these laws into practice so that they can be something other than a symbolic gesture. I think symbolic gestures matter. They say what our ideals are. Uh, they help shape our sense of collective identity. But they're not enough to actually result in better treatment for animals. It's very easy for prosecutors to ignore them. It's very easy for judges to ignore them um, and for nothing to change. So it's important. It's great. But it's one step among many. And so I still think some kind of collective, uh, pluralistic approach is going to be necessary in order to make things better for animals. Um, uh, I, will, I will say one footnote, or one postscript, uh, which is that there was one cool thing that came out of the uh, 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 non-human rights case project in New York in the spring, which is, of course, the New York Court of Appeals decided not to hear the case, which is not surprising. They decide not to hear 95% of the cases that, that are brought to them. But one amazing thing happened, which is that one of the judges on this court, Judge Fahey, wrote a 10-page opinion uh, that, that was published along with this decision not to hear the case, where he said, to be clear, our decision not to hear this case has nothing, has nothing to do with the merits of the case. I personally agree with the, the Non-Human Rights Project and the, the amicus brief authors about the merits of the case. I agree with them that the past judges who have kicked out the idea of non-human personhood have done so on uninformed and inconsistent grounds, that these are bad arguments. I agree with them that the basis for personhood we accept in the human case, if applied consistently, would allow for the possibility of non-human personhood too. And I agree with them that this is seemingly a very serious injustice that the courts are going to have to address at some point, hopefully sometime soon. Uh, so, so he wrote this remarkable 10-page opinion that did essentially agree with all of the philosophical points and legal points that we in the Non-Human Rights Project have made. And our hope is that even though nothing changed for Kiko and Tommy, these two chimpanzees who we were trying to secure freedom for, uh, although hopefully we can explore other possibilities for that, our hope is that this made legitimate in the legal community, an argument that had been a little bit easier to dismiss. Now, a judge in a top court in New York has said that this is a serious issue that we need to address. And I hope that, at least informally, that sets a certain kind of precedent that will allow these arguments to have a little bit more traction in the future. So that part feels a little bit promising, even though there's mostly still a very long, long road ahead. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. All right, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So does anybody have any questions? And please wait for the mic as we're uh, um, recording this. Um, thanks so much. I have to reveal that I've been with the Animal Legal Defense Fund on the board since it began. Thank you. I started out <laughs> with Stephen Wise in Boston. So you can imagine this has been my life. Yeah. And that presentation was spectacular, and I bet you Chris agrees with me. You've got all the salient points. Oh, thank you. And you've brought it up to date, so I'm very impressed. And um, I have so many thoughts, and, and I've often grappled with the idea of equitable ownership mm -hmm. of um, any sentient being. Mm -hmm. But again, it, would it be by law? If it's by law, you've got it right. It doesn't matter. It can be overturned. It can be ignored. Mm -hmm. So basically, I see what Steve's going to accomplish in the Non-Human Rights Project is that if you have a captive chimpanzee in the United States, mm -hmm. you have to put them in sanctuary. Yeah. But beyond that, as he would often explain if he were here, you yeah. have the glass that you keep filling up with empty glass. You start filling it with rights. That would be only the first one. Yeah. So I don't see it as a huge threat. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm a retired administrative law judge, so down and dirty stuff in state government. So you yeah. try to get all the data you can, but you try to find something you can hold on to, and that's yeah. what Judge Fahey did. So yeah. thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for all of your work on these issues, too. Um, yeah, just to, just to briefly add to that, um, sorry, what's, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, OK. Um, part of what Sarah is referring to is that one of the critiques of Steve Wise is the president of the Non-Human Rights Project and, and the person who started it has been working on these issues for many years. Um, part, one of the criticisms of them is, well, all, all that you are doing is focusing on especially intelligent human-like animals like chimpanzees and showing, look how similar they are to us, look how intelligent they are, so they should have 
like one right, like a right to habeas corpus relief, but then all the other animals who are in our food system are still left out in the cold. And if anything, we might be reinforcing this rationalism, this, this idea that you need to be rational in order to matter. Uh, we might be doing more harm than good. Uh, but but as, as Sarah points out, I think Steve's response, which is right, is this is a way of getting our foot in the door and making progress towards a much more revolutionary uh, uh, approach to legal standing for animals. Because if you can just, again, find one animal who should have one right, and, and maybe strategically get the animal closest to us, and the right that has historically been most effective in terms of um, establishing legal recognition for previously unrecognized groups, again, not to say that those cases are similar, um, if you can find that animal and get that right and just show that much is warranted, then you really have opened the door to a much more general conversation about, about what this all means. And so I do endorse the strategy, even though I'm very happy a lot of people are advocating for more abolitionist, abolitionist and revolutionary things right now, too. I think we need a division of labor. And for those who don't know, this is Sarah Luke. She also was on the board of uh, um, Neves for a really long time. And, yes. she, and she and Paul Waldo were the number two and number three people I met in the field back uh, 19 years ago in Steve wow. Wise's kitchen. So That's amazing. Um, that's amazing. Uh, we've got another question over here. I believe it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. This was a great presentation. Thank and um, the last two points you made about sort of possible next steps, I think, are like, I, I very much agree with and don't know which way I would go. But I, yeah. I sort of wonder so, you know, if we imagine that we have achieved one of these things, there still sort of exist these liminal spaces that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there's a reason for concern, even in those positions, because something like um, talking about what counts as sentience is yeah. still applying personhood in terms of some sort of um, phenomenal experience of, of yeah. being human. And, mm -hmm. and so there's still this sort of anthropomorphic tinge, I think, mm -hmm. to something like personhood. And so yeah. is that not a reason for a long-term concern? And if we were sort of freed from the constraints of a legal system that is kind of built in to that, to that history, yeah. is there a way to approach this problem without um, dabbling in those... Yeah. In those waters. Yeah. So uh, one one critique of sentience as a basis for personhood is that all this does is replicate the same problem at a lower level. Like first we pick species membership, yay, a group we happen to be members of. Then we picked rational agents, once again, yay, a group we happen to be members of. Now we've picked sentience, which is yay, like a little bit more of a general group that we nevertheless still happen to be members of. And so these are all anthropocentric, human-centered um, uh, conceptions of what it takes to merit legal recognition. I think there is no getting around the fact that our perspective is necessarily anthropocentric. Maybe when the AIs take over, they can build a slightly more objective legal system that will. <laughs> but, but then we have to solve the value alignment problem, and we have to make sure we program them with the right values, and our programming them with human values would, would replicate the problem there. So there's really no getting, getting around this. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I will say a few things. One, one is that we, unless we want to say literally every entity in the universe has the same legal rights, we do have to make discriminations and we do have to do that for, from our own limited human epistemic perspective. And so I think the best we can do is be as thoughtful and critical and reflective as possible about doing that. And, what, and, and that was part of why it was interesting to work with a team of philosophers on the amicus brief, because we actually, the members of this team, disagree about what the basis of personhood should be or whether personhood should even be a category. We disagree about that, but the thesis that we advocated for was that if we insist on classifying everyone as either a person or a thing, then at least some non-human should count as persons for the reasons I, I mentioned in the talk. And if, if we were forced to advocate for a conception of personhood, we would do it in roughly the way that judges do, actually. Um, I believe sentience, for various reasons I won't get into right now, should be the basis for personhood, the capacity to feel pleasure and pain. I think that should be the basis for personhood. But other people think it should have more to do with a certain kind of agency or autonomy. Other people should think it should have something more to do with certain relationships of care and interdependence. And that was why the view we advocate for legally is the same disjunctive view that people use in the human case. If you have one or more of those things, you, you make it in. And otherwise, if you have literally none of those things, then maybe we can safely say you, you don't count for now. Uh, and then maybe that will be revealed to be a horrible injustice in like 100 years. So I'll let somebody else deal with that. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. 
As someone who's involved in a number of effective altruism organizations like Animal Charity Evaluators, how do you think through decisions about how best limited resources can be expended on the different approaches to pr solving problems as, as substantial and significant as those um, surrounding the ways that we treat other non-human animals? Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you weigh approaches that are more quantifi quantifiable versus um, longer term for possibly riskier yeah. strategies like advocating for um, non-human rights? Oh, that's a great question. I, I mean, obviously we only have a few minutes left and I know that we might have uh, another question or two, so I'll try to keep it brief, but this is something I've been thinking a lot about uh, and, and I could I could uh, share share some things with you uh, uh, to read if, if you're interested. But, but the, the short version is I do accept the so-called utilitarian or effective altruist framework and basically this says we should take an impartially benevolent approach to setting priorities when it comes to activism and advocacy and philanthropy. So when we're deciding how to use scarce resources to help others, we should think in terms of scale, how many lives are at stake, neglectedness, how neglected is this issue compared to other issues, and tractability. Are there effective and efficient things that we can do to make a meaningful difference with respect to this issue? And the higher an issue ranks with respect to scale, neglectedness, and tractability, all else being equal, the, the higher a priority I think it should have when it comes to activism and advocacy and philanthropy. But, briefly, uh, I think that if we focus too much on that metric in practice, there are various risks like a risk of measurability bias. We might find ourselves being biased in favor of the types of work where you can see measurable benefits. Uh, and that would lead to a bias in favor of like moderate, short-term, direct, individual service provision type work and away from like radical, long-term, indirect, structural change type work. And so uh, the, the, more, the more people accept this framework and the more influential it gets, I think the more pressure there will be to balance it out with um, a complementary investment in the types of non-measurable but clearly very important long-term, risky, revolutionary strategies that are always important parts of social movements. So I think there needs to be a pluralistic balance. But, but for the most part, I think we should do the most good we can. Thank you very much for the talk. Very uh, thought-provoking. Um, I was sort of surprised that you said the second of the two alternatives that you gave uh, in terms of paths forward, creating a third category, mm -hmm. um, wasn't the more revolutionary of the two. Ah. In the sense that, um, I assume I'm an historian, so this will sort of be, come from that. Um, but the Roman law in the civil law tradition from at least the second century is, has this, this uh, dichotomous uh, mm -hmm. creation of persons and things. Yeah. But it's baked into common law as well from yeah. the 12th and 13th through this 18th and thereby yeah. into American law. Um, and I don't know about uh, other traditions, so I can't speak to that. Yeah. But so to my mind, the, the creation of the third category, category was therefore more revolutionary. But I don't yeah. necessarily see... Um, that sharp a distinction between an expansion of personhood mm -hmm. um, and this creation of a sentient being category. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they're qualitatively, uh, they're, not, they're not quantitatively different than that's, that's yeah. a long way to phrase it, but they're not so revolutionarily different. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I, I, I basically agree with you. I think uh, it, it, the, the creation of a third category is more revolutionary in the sense of changing a fundamental assumption that many legal communities have made for many, many uh, generations. Uh, in that sense, it would be more revolutionary. In another sense, it would be less revolutionary because it would be making that kind of fundamental change in the service of maintaining a conventional type of hierarchy. Um, and, and so in that sense, the more revolutionary act would be preserving the fundamental nature of the system, but allowing that many more individuals should be treated with equal consideration under the system than we originally thought. But, but at the end of the day, I agree with you, and that is why I said I'm highly uncertain which of these strategies is optimal, and I'm happy that different people are pursuing different ones, because at the end of the day, uh, what really matters is that we just move the ball forward on legal standing for animals and couple that with really good, effective advocacy. I think that sounds like a good place to wrap it up. Um, uh, I'm sure Jeff will be happy to stick around and answer some questions. Uh, we just need to clear the room, because there's a class here okay. afterwards. But thank you, everyone. Join me in thanking Jeff Siegel again.